Hey, good morning. My name is Ty, and I am so, so happy that you decided to join us this morning. I don't know where you're watching from today, but I'm in southern Indiana. For some weird reason, it decided to get cold, and it feels like it's fall again. But I would love to hear where you're watching from, uh, because it's the unofficial start to summer. And I don't know what kind of cool plans that you have for the weekend. I know I'm planning on going swimming tomorrow. Whether it's cold or warm, I'm going to do that. So go ahead, let's interact with our care team that's online. And, uh, and let us know where you're, where you're watching from today and what super cool plans that you have to uh, do tomorrow on your, on your day off. Uh, Patrick is going to come up here in a little bit and uh, bring us the word today in our sermon for this I Will series. Before that, we're going to have a little bit of worship, some prayer time, some communion. So go ahead and grab your elements uh, wherever you're watching from today. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be some sort of food or drink, but let's uh, get ready to take that meal together. Uh, and then again, the care team is online and we're excited to connect with you, pray with you. Uh, just let us know what need you have today. It doesn't matter what it is. We'd love to interact with you today. So get ready. Church Anywhere starts right now. Church, we're so glad you're here with us today. If you're in person and join us online, we're glad that you're here. We have a great service. Let's sing. We're going to sing. Too high, this weary soul is down the bone. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting.
If this is your story today, church, we're going to sing this together as one voice. Whether in this room, across the hall, online, behind bars today, we sing this in confidence. This is our story. This is our testimony. Come on. You pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master. I think the same. Come on. I thank God. Yeah, amen. We're going to continue to worship this morning, and there's only one reason truly that we're here, and it's the name of Jesus. It's the man of Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, the Messiah. We're here to worship him and focus our hearts on him, hear from him our hearts and focus our hearts this morning. Let's sing. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your prayer I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone In your presence, Lord We say, Holy Spirit, come Yeah. 
This is a big weekend for our country. It's a big weekend. It's not a weekend to celebrate veterans who have served. We'll do that in September. It's a weekend to honor and to remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Those who gave their very life and left behind their families so that you and I could live in a country that we could be free and have liberty. Amen. And I just want to I want to thank those families who sacrificed so greatly so we could have what we have. We're also here this morning in this time to do the same, to remember. That's what that's what Jesus asked us to do. He asked us to remember that God sent his one and only son to die on a cross for you and for me. So today we're going to honor Jesus and remember what he did for us. And it's on a much bigger scale because he says he did it for the whole world, not just for the United States, but also for our enemies. He did it for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die for you and me so we could have life and have it everlasting. He died for the United States. He died for China. He died for Russia. He died, for, you can go on and on and on, the whole world, so that we could have life and have it everlasting. So this morning, as we share in this meal together, let's honor and remember what our Savior did for each and every one of us. I hope when you came in, you picked up your little communion packet there, and, and you'll be ready to join us. I'm going to say a prayer here in just a moment, and you can take that whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've set apart for us to come together and to commune with one another, but most importantly, with you. Lord, I thank you for the sacrifice. I thank you for sending your son to die for each one of us so we could have life and have it everlasting. Lord, I ask now that you would bless this bread that represents your body. You bless this cup that represents your blood. In Jesus' name. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time. Took my place, laid inside my. 
Every week we take time out in our service to give back to a God who has given us so very much. And I just want to remind you of the different ways that you can give. Uh, as you leave today, there's boxes at each exit. You can give there. You can go to our website, our app, or you can just drop it here at the church. Whatever works for you. I want to, I want to thank you for your generosity. About three, a little over three years ago here at the church, we had this thing called a 90-day challenge. How many of you remember that 90-day challenge? Yeah, it was a really cool time for our church, and our leadership challenged us to give above and beyond what we had ever given. And it was all based on a little scripture from Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, where God said, if you give, you test me in this and see what I'll do with it. And boy, did he do some amazing things with it. One of the things I love that our leadership did, they could have taken the money and put it into this building or paid parking lots. They could have done a lot of different things, but that's not what they did. They took it out into the world and they gave it away. They gave it away to our local community. They gave it away to surrounding communities. They gave it away around the world. And what a difference it made. One of those places they gave to, they gave $20,000 to a little place up the road called Freed From Within. Many of you know that place is near and dear to me. I've been a part of that ministry since 2004, and it's one of the reasons I'm standing on this stage today. It's a transitional living facility where men who get out of jail and prison have a place to make a new start. And we had a dream there. We had a dream of this campus on the hill, but we couldn't figure out how to get it started. So the church said, here's $20,000, but there's a stipulation. You can't use it for operating funds. You have to write a letter telling us what you're going to do with that $20,000. And 
and we decided if we're ever going to do it, now's the time. So we decided we were going to have a three-year capital campaign to build that campus on the hill. And here's what your generosity has done. God should get a hand clap of praise for that. That's phase one, and it is completed, and it's completely paid for. Go, God. It's incredible what God can do. So I want to remind you once again, when you give, lives are changed. And one of those lives was mine. Thank you. Here in just a moment, we're going to continue in our series, I Will Follow. Patrick will be out right after this video. friends, uh, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, thank you so much uh, for being uh, here. Uh, I just wanted to start off by just saying a quick thank you. As many of you know, uh, my family added our firstborn son uh, a month ago today. Uh, so myself and Abigail and August, I want to thank our church family for just the incredible amount of generosity that has been shown to our family, uh, whether that's through encouragement and love and whether that's a conversation, a congratulations, food or prayer, like we're just so thankful for all of it. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much for being for our uh, growing family over the last couple weeks and over the last couple months as the generosity has just come in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be camping out in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn there or, or get there, uh, however you do that. We're actually going to be finishing out today our I Will series, I Will Follow series. And actually, we're fi finishing up our last I Will series of series. Is. This is our last message in our long series of I Will. If you've been with us, if you've been uh, tuning in, We've been going through the last five months learning about what it means to follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus. We have learned together that if we want to be followers and disciples of Jesus, we must deny ourselves, we must take up our cross, we must follow, and we must do those things on a daily basis. And my prayer and my hope is that throughout these last five months, we've all learned together just what steps we need to take in getting one step closer to Jesus and learn the those things, right? But then actually putting those things into practice, actually taking one step closer every day. We started the series all those months ago with a thought in mind, with this belief in mind. We look around uh, at specifically this country, but around the world as well. We look around and we see a lot of believers, a lot of people who say that they are Christians, but we cannot say the same about intentional followers of Jesus, we see believers, but we know through Scripture that Jesus actually calls us, calls Christians to be sold, sold out all in, bet the farm, followers of Christ. Giving him, giving Jesus everything that we've got. This thought of seeing believers but not intentional disciples proves itself when we look at the latest statistics and the latest data. Uh, I just actually heard randomly this past week that a new data set has been put out. And so uh, a group called the Millennials, maybe you've heard of them, that's uh, about the age of 40 and below. 43% of that age group uh, say that they do not believe in God and even further past that, that there is no use for a God at all. And so that's a brand new one to add kind of to my repertoire. But there's a statistic that I've said from this stage before that has kind of been the driving force behind a lot of my ministry for the last couple of years. And that statistic is this. According to studies done by the Fuller Youth Institute in Barna, 60 to 70 percent of Christian Generation Z, so that's the generation that have graduated college and below, so Christian Generation Z are choosing to walk away from Jesus in their first two weeks out of their home after high school. 
So I must reiterate that these are Christian Generation Z students, students that have walked through things like Kids Quest Junior, walked through things like Kids Quest, walked through things like Quest, grew up in Christian homes and households and still choose at the end of their high school career after the first two weeks of high school to leave the faith in Jesus, that they walk away from their belief and faith. In Jesus, And that's an incredibly shocking and a, a statistic to me and a wake-up call to me as a new dad about how important my job is as a father and a minister to my son, August. But this phenomenon is not new. This is not a new thing. People choosing to leave the faith in Jesus or choosing to walk away from Jesus is not something that just randomly started happening in 2021. Right? For, for thousands of years, people have chose uh, to walk away. And even while Jesus was still walking and preaching and healing here on the earth, people chose to walk away from him. And that's actually what we're going to be seeing here today in John chapter 6. Let me set the stage really quick before we get into it. Jesus in the, is in the middle of a series of miracles, of many signs and wonders. Chapters 2 through 11 are all chock full of Jesus performing a lot of different miracles. He has uh, uh, healed people from the paralysis. He has uh, turned water into wine. And now we see at the beginning of chapter 6 in John that he feeds a multitude of people. It says five 5,000 men were among that crowd. And some would even say that that's not counting the women and children that were also there. So the number could be as high as 30,000 people. He has to feed that many people because throughout these miracles, throughout these teachings, and throughout these uh, preachings, he has amassed this huge following. That's how many people have started to follow Jesus and just go wherever he went. A, a crowd the size of Harrison County... An entire county, right, is following Jesus. And in John chapter 6, I just imagine the crowd of people, this 30,000 group of people just waiting on Jesus to do one more greater thing. One miracle to top off all of the other miracles, to get more things. It's almost like at the end of a concert, right? It's almost like they're waiting for an encore, so imagine everybody in the room, everybody watching online. Imagine you're at a concert, okay? You remember concerts, right? Those were a thing. Uh, they're back. I'm going to one in October. I'm super uh, pumped about that. So imagine you're at a concert of your favorite band. Everybody picture your favorite band right now in your head. So I'm going to need some congregation participation in this part. So I'm going to give you a bunch of, uh, of extra time so you can think of what you're going to say because I need everybody in the room to say it. I need everybody watching online to type it in the comment section down below. What is your favorite band? If you could choose one band to go see at a concert right now, who would that band be? You're all going to say it out loud when I say go after counting to three. Okay, I'm giving you way more time because if this doesn't happen, it ruins the rest of the sermon. Okay, so you don't want that to happen, right? So on the count of three, when I say go, everybody's going to say their favorite band. Got it? Cool. Everybody give me a thumbs up if you got it. That's like happy. Uh, come on, guys. I need more. Okay, we'll see how this goes. Okay, ready? Favorite band. One, two, three, go. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. How could everyone think and say journey at the same time? Everyone typed in Journey on the comments, too. That's absolutely incredible. Who could have predicted us having the same mind and of the same heart to say Journey, right? So let's say we're at everybody's favorite band, right? We're at a concert for Journey. We're all at a Journey concert. They're actually at Lollapalooza this year. Uh, they're following right after Megan the Stallion. So if you want to uh, make this a reality, you can go and pay $1,000 to go watch that. Uh, anyway, so we're all experiencing a Journey concert together. And so they open it up. The place is going crazy. They open up with any way you wanted, and the place is just electrified, right? Everybody's going nuts. Everybody's screaming. like, yeah, this is awesome. This is the best thing that I've ever been a part of. Separate Ways starts next, quickly followed by Wheel in the Sky, and everybody's just on cloud nine, right? And not just because of, like, the inevitable, inevitable drugs that are being passed around at a Journey concert. No, actually, everybody is saying no to drugs because the power of the music is just so strong and intoxicating. Everybody just feels it and loves it. They start, Journey starts doing stuff from their newest album, and you're like, okay, whatever, I don't really care about that. Uh, we tolerate it because we know that the best step is yes, yet to come, and boom, 
open arms plays, lights play, loving, touching, squeezing, all these play one after the other. They're getting their hits. They're building up to this grand finale, right? Faithfully begins in four minutes and 27 se- glorious seconds later, starts to fade away, and it's time for the greatest song in the world, right? You know it. Everybody knows it. It's time for that song. We are all so jacked. But out of nowhere, without any warning, Journey just walks off the stage. And you're like, what? What just happened? Like, everybody knows that there's still one song to be played. Where the heck was Don't Stop Believing? right? We all get collectively angry. We're about to rush the stage, uh, grab our pitchforks and uh, tiki torches, I guess. Uh, but then we realize, all collectively together, oh, Journey wants to give us the encore of all encores. They want us to start chanting so they can come out and just blow our minds with Don't Stop Believing. So we all start shouting, encore, encore, encore. Well, we'll just time out really quick. Just a quick note about something I've noticed. That never happens here. I've been here for a long time, okay? After the service, I never start hearing chants of encore, and I'm just really confused about that. Today might be a good start. I don't know. Okay, time back in. We're back at the concert. Encore. Encore. Right? The chant goes on for 30 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, and they don't come back out. A stage hand comes onto the stage with a microphone, and they go, the concert is over. Please leave. Please spend the next five to 15 hours going back to your cars, finding your cars, a lot of which windows have been smashed in. Sorry about that. And then spend the next five hours after that actually getting out of the venue. Thank you. To just be in that frenzy of an amazing series of moments, right? All to be let down at the very end. To be expectant of being given a greater, more glorious, better thing. Only to be met with disappointment. That's kind of what I imagine it to be like for the crowds following Jesus. They expect to get more. They expected to be given more. They expected more, but instead of more, Jesus actually just sneaks off across the lake to the other side and gets away from the crowd. The crowd wakes up the next morning and finds themselves without a leader to follow. And here's uh, where we get into scripture. Verse 24, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples, disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search for Jesus. This would be like at that Journey concert, we, go, we rush backstage with the tiki torches, right? And we're like, Steve Perry, come on, you got to give us one more song. Except or whoever they've got now that's not Steve Perry, I don't know. Anyway, verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? In other words, why did you leave us? Where the heck did you go? We were still here. We, you know, got any more bread? Like, we would love some more bread, actually. Why did you leave us? And Jesus answered to them in the next 15 verses, right? He answers them in the next 15 verses. This answer will actually lead to people abandoning him. Here's what we find, actually, 31 verses later, verse 66 of chapter 6. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So what could Jesus have possibly said or done to make them leave? And when he says those things to us, are we going to leave as well? There's one main thing that Jesus says here that makes thousands of people turn their back on him. Let's find out together why they leave. Let's jump back in. Verse 25. We read it. Let's read it one more time. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Jesus says, you're not looking for me. You're not really following me. You're not following me for my own sake because of what I'm preaching and teaching in the miracles. You're following me and looking for me so that you can get more stuff, so that you can get the good things that I provide. You just want to eat, right? You just want to eat bread, And we look at those people, uh, and we read this scripture, and we look at those people that abandoned Jesus, and we're like, what? Like, Jesus is literally standing and eating with you. He's there. What we want to do to be a part of that, and you abandoned him for not giving you more food? Like, what in the world? Which, first point, to be honest, like, that's that's really easy for us to say when it's a land of the plenty, Um, but 
what we need to realize is back then, these people are, are poor and starving. If they don't get food from him, they might, it's likely that they would die of starvation. But more importantly, who among us has not been a part of that crowd? Who among us, either in the past or even currently, are only following Jesus because of the blessings that he has and gives to us? Whether that's good standing in our community or whether that's uh, God has blessed you monetarily or maybe you're a believer of God because Jesus means a one-way trip to paradise when you die, a one-way trip to heaven. But Jesus actually rebukes and teaches against this type of thinking and this type of faith in John chapter 6. Verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus is saying, don't follow me. Don't work for me. Don't even call yourself a Christian for the sake of the blessings that I can give you. But follow me for the blessing that I am. Follow me for the blessing that my presence is. Jesus is the blessing. Jesus' presence is the blessing within our lives. For the blessing of Jesus, Jesus' presence is greater than any other good thing in all of creation. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Now this is not to put a guilt trip on those in the room and those that are watching online who are following Jesus, who are followed Jesus like that in the past. We said it from the stage multiple times, and so it bears repeating, is that we all, right, if we're followers of Jesus, if we've been dunked, if we've been baptized, all those certain things, like, we have all come to Jesus because he has something we can never attain for ourselves. He has something that we can never give to ourselves, that we can never get from creation. But that is not where Jesus wants us to stay. Jesus never wants us to stay there. Jesus accepts us and loves us for where we are and who we are, but he calls us to something greater wherever we are. That's why we use the language of taking one step closer to Jesus every single day. It's because whether you just heard about Jesus this morning for the first time or if you've been following him for 150 years, every single one of us has a daily step forward in our relationship and journey with Jesus. Every single person has one step more. And for this specific instance, in these specific verses, the thing that Jesus calls us to, the step uh, he wants us to take is the step out of this type of living where we only follow Jesus to get his blessings. Whether that's money or heaven or just in general, a better life. A life of following Jesus is not about getting the blessings. He is the blessing. He is the blessing. He is the one that we get and all else fades away. To experience firsthand the goodness of Jesus, to experience the fact that there will always be someone on your side who will never leave you nor forsake you, to experience the love that Jesus has for you, a love that Romans 8 promises us can never be taken away, that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from that love, to know that our past does not define us, that our sin does not define us, but rather that he has defined us based on the cross. That is the goodness of Jesus Christ. It is his very presence, not the miracles, not the blessings. It is Jesus alone. And that's why any sort of prosperity gospel just does not have a leg to stand on. A life of following Jesus is not about getting the good things, but receiving the good of Jesus into our lives. And so many believers just aren't to that point yet. And the crowd that was following Jesus in John chapter 6 definitely was not to that point. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven, indicating Jesus is the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven, again Jesus, and gives life to the world. Verse 34, the people just don't get it. Sir, always give us this bread. Jesus is trying so hard here. Those who have ears, let him hear. Come and listen. I am the bread of life. I have come into the world to give life to the world. I am the only one who can sustain you. And the crowd responds, okay, cool, awesome, wow, you know. You got any more bread? Maybe a sourdough starter, if nothing else. Unfortunately, that's what we see throughout the rest of John chapter 6. They just go back and forth. 
What we see for the rest of the chapter is Jesus trying again and again to make it more and more obvious and more and more clear that he is the bread of life, that Jesus is what the people need. At their very core, they don't need blessings, they don't need miracle, they don't need money, they don't need bread, they need Jesus. And the crowd just continues to respond in anger and confusion. And you can read on uh, today or later this week, but I'll just summarize it for you really quick, kind of how that conversation goes until it reaches a breaking point. Jesus, you need, Jesus says, you need heavenly bread. And the crowd goes, okay, cool, give us bread. You know, we want bread. Jesus, I am the heavenly bread. Crowd, you're just a dude from Nazareth, you know? How can you say that you're from heaven? This doesn't make any sense. Jesus responds to that, says, you're not understanding. You must have me for sustenance. Just as you consume bread from your physical and uh, hunger pains, you must consume me for your life pains, for your life sustenance. And the crowd just goes, consume flesh? Are you kidding me? Eat blood or drink blood, eat flesh? This guy's crazy. Come on, gang. Let's get out of here. Jesus has had his time. He's a crazy person now. Verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. One by one, that 30,000 who have followed them with, who has followed Jesus with their very life, turns their backs on the bread of life and walks away. And I can just imagine Jesus with tears welling up in his eyes saying this to his closest 12. Are you also going to leave? We just need to take a quick pause here, a quick reflection time. Because this just shows a beautiful human side of Jesus that we don't necessarily think about very much. Is that rejection is a shared human experience. Whether that's relationships, whether that's jobs or friendships, it hurts so bad to see people walk away. People that we've had relationships for a long time. It's heartbreaking to hear these verses of Jesus' experiences, gut-wrenching rejection. But at the same time, it's encouraging to me and hopefully to you that Jesus is with us in our rejection, that Jesus is with us fully in our rejection and with us fully in our rejection. He has complete and perfect empathy towards every single person in this room and those that are watching online. He is with us and he is for us even in rejection. So Jesus turns to his disciples. So are you gonna leave too? Verse 68, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. You know, there are just a couple times in the gospels where Peter just nails it where Peter, he's one of Jesus' closest disciples, just absolutely gets it. He's a faith here that I wish I had, that I wish I could answer in that way. I wish I could answer Jesus like that. Where else are we supposed to go, Jesus? There's nowhere else. You are the one that gives eternal life. And some of you might be wondering, hey, wait a second. A couple paragraphs ago, you just went through that we don't follow Jesus just so that we have eternal life, right? There's a disconnect here. Where's that disconnect? What we need to understand is that the gospel definition of everlasting life, eternal life, and really the whole uh, arc of Scripture's definition of eternal and everlasting life is a little bit different than what we first think about. When we hear the words eternal life, we think of the life to come, always. We think of heaven. We think of that as eternal life. We immediately go to paradise, But Jesus' definition of everlasting eternal life encapsulates not only the life to come, but also this life right here. Jesus' when we follow Jesus, our everlasting perfect life begins now. Not perfect in the sense that everything's going to be okay and great and awesome all the time, but perfect in the way that we have Jesus so nothing else matters. Jesus has the words that lead to the best, greatest, and everlasting life for right now. It's why he prays, God, your will be done here as it is in heaven. Our call as followers of Jesus is not just to wait on heaven once we accept Jesus. It's also to bring heaven here throughout our life. It's to pull heaven down through good things. Dallas Willard says it well, salvation or getting saved is not about getting into heaven someday. It's about getting heaven into us today. And then another author, Rich Philotus, said it like this, the gospel is not just about God's grace offered to sinful individuals. It's also about the formation of communities that demonstrate the life and the love of Jesus. 
The gospel always begins with what Christ has done and needs to continue with what Christ is doing through his new people. We have been given heaven through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, it it gives us the presence of heaven, the full presence of God. And because we are called to be followers of Jesus, we are called to bring heaven wherever we are, everywhere that we go, to bring the good and the blessings, the love of Jesus into our communities, into our neighborhoods, and into our homes. Wherever you are, if you follow Jesus, you are called to bring heaven here, to bring the good. You have been called to take one step closer to Jesus by focusing on giving the good rather than getting the good. By giving and being the blessings of Jesus rather than receiving the blessings of Jesus. The church of Jesus is called to be the primary vessel of good in all of creation. So how do we do that practically this week? One of the things that pops up in my mind as I read through the Gospels and then one of the primary ways that Jesus brought heaven into earth during his ministry was by simply having meals with people, specifically by having meals with people that no one else would, to accept and love a person so fully that they would have a meal with that person, specifically having a meal with the hated, the sinner, and the stranger. When Zacchaeus, the most One of the most hated men in all of that community at the time. When he climbed up on a tree, what did Jesus respond with? He said, I'm going to your house and I want to have a meal with you. The bread of life broke bread with those that felt rejected by society, with those that felt unloved, that felt unaccepted. Jesus was a host in every situation. Whether or not he was the homeowner of that house, he was always the host, loving and accepting and gracefully and lovingly welcoming people into the kingdom of heaven one meal at a time. In the Bible, the act of hospitality is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a gift that uh, God says is only given to some people. It's a commandment that every, by our, every Jesus follower is supposed to act upon. Biblical authors believe that the way of Jesus inviting people into uh, meals was a way that every disciple should live because it showed an amazing amount of love, an amazing amount of acceptance. It showed heaven at its very core to eat with, to laugh with, and to joke around at a dinner table. And I think it shows the same thing today as well. When's the last time you ate with or had a meal with someone who wasn't your friends or close friends or someone who was family? We never think about inviting the stranger into our homes and into and around our dinner tables. But that's exactly what people need right now. They need that connection. They need that love. And once we feel safe enough to do that, once the people of God feel safe enough to do that, we are called to be the ones who are first in line, welcoming people back, loving people into our homes and neighborhoods and communities. So what am I asking you to do? Pretty simply, I'm asking you to be a host to be an inviter, to be Jesus and grill up some hamburgers for those in your community and those in your neighborhood who don't feel loved and cared for, who who need to feel the love of Jesus, who needs to go to your cookout tomorrow, who needs to be invited. People feel loved and accepted around a dinner table. And of course, it's not just eating with people, right? To put it simply, any way that you can show the love of Jesus to others, Jesus calls you to take that step. Jesus' followers should not be motivated by receiving blessings, but only by providing blessings to others. That is the greatest eternal life, to bring heaven to wherever you are right now. Thy kingdom come, God's will be done, in Harrison County as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, anywhere you are, as it is in heaven. Church, let's be the good and let's bring the good. Let's pray. Father, it is difficult to act like your son in so many aspects of life. And this one might be especially hard for some in this room and some watching online. God, would you give us the courage and the bravery to invite our neighbors to welcome people in? to love them well, to show them Jesus in a way that they've never seen Jesus before. God, we ask for your spirit to be working among this room. Show us the right steps to take in every 
day-to-day living. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Lean up and sing. (laughs) Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of ever the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath. I need your help. Sing it out. Yeah, fill this house. foundation. You're the only one worthy of our praise. Father, when the winds come and the waves come, we will not be shaken because our God is a rock, a firm foundation. Father, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can somebody give a praise today? It's been a great service. 
Amen, amen. Will you grab a seat just for another second? Last year, um, actually last year, we weren't even meeting in person yet. I believe the first week of June, we started coming, come, coming back or a couple weeks after that. And COVID completely took our summer. And so this year, we're gonna take summer back, if that's okay with you guys. Will you take a look at this video? Hey, Donnie, how you do? Donnie, what's wrong? I just, I just really miss summer. I miss swimming pools and a beach and baseball games. I just, I just really miss summer. Well, what if I were to tell you that we're gonna take back summer? Really? Yes, really, we're going to. Really? Yes. You know, after a really long, really cold winter, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take back summer, amen? It is gonna be super excited around here. I mean, it's gonna be legend, wait for it, airy. It's gonna be awesome. Every week there's gonna be something really cool going on here at the church, and it's gonna start next weekend. We're gonna have a couple of food trucks, a barbecue truck, and a taco truck, so save your change this week. Uh, there's going to be some seats set up outside so we can connect and hang out together. It's going to be a good day. And then that evening at 7 o'clock, there's going to be an award-winning movie shown here, The Fight. I know some of you have seen it. It's a really good movie, and we're going to tie that to a fundraiser for the Rockners. So it's going to be really cool. Stop by the Hub and pick one of these up. It tells everything that's going to go on uh, for the next few weekends. So I'm super excited. I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. You're dismissed. Just a small town girl Living in a lonely world She took the
We really hope that you enjoyed that message today from Patrick about bringing heaven to earth. This week, I'd love to challenge you to see how that you can be a blessing to others. Uh, what's a blessing to us is to hear from you. Uh, I was able to connect with a guy this week in San Antonio and just able to pray with him about how this ministry is a blessing to him. And it's, it was really encouraging to me, and I hope it was encouraging to him as well. Uh, another way that I would love to hear from you is if uh, you're in prison, go ahead and write us a letter. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you right where you're at. So anyway, we hope that you guys enjoy your Memorial Day holiday, and we'll see you next time.